It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kowaleen Clarice May, DMD. She's a general dentist in Manchester, New Hampshire. She received her doctorate degree from Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. She is the CEO of Doctors Out of Debt and the founders of Doctors Out of Debt on Facebook, a platform to help doctors get out of debt and create generational wealth. She graduated from dental school in 2011 and had a total of debt of $250,000 in student loans and was able to pay off everything in four and a half years. She has been helping coaching doctors how to have similar results and create generational wealth. She has had the opportunity to work in different areas of dentistry from public health, Medicaid clinic, geriatric dentistry, where she met me, uh, nursing home dentistry, where she's preparing for me, academia, mobile dentistry, corporation to private practice. She has been on several podcasts and is an avid speaker at several professional schools and business clubs regarding debt repayment and generational wealth. She is also an entrepreneur investor and has several businesses that she operates. When Dr. is not seeing patients or coaching doctors, she can be found spending quality time with her husband and daughter, Olivia. Was she named after Olivia Newton-John? No. <laughs> Is this an Australian thing that you got going there? <laughs> well, hey, I, I'm so honored to have you come on the show, but I have to give you one warning. Dentists, they don't, they live above their means. I mean, I every dentist I meet, I'll just say, go name one feature where you're in the middle. I mean, is, is your house average? No, it's too much house. Is your car, please tell me your car's a Toyota. No, it's too much. Um, your wedding ring, is it one of those little things that came out of the cereal box? No, it's a big old rock. Um, I mean, where are you going on vacation? Are you going to get a case of beer and go to the lake and fish? No, we're flying and we're taking a cruise. We're going to Hawaii. I mean, they don't do one thing at the median, let alone beyond. I mean, it's like they they got a, a degree, DDS stands for a degree in debt service. And then you start a, a company, Doctors Out of Debt. Were you out of your mind when you thought Ooh. doctors could live below their means? Well, it can be done, and I did it. And I'm helping so many other doctors do it. So let me tell you. So as you know, I graduated from Tufts in 2011, and I was so proud of myself to graduate, to finally be a doctor. See, I didn't get in dental school before the first time I applied. So it was a big accomplishment. I'm like, I did it. Because they even used to say um, in dental school that at Tufts, they used to say, it's harder to get out than to get in. So I was so proud. I was like, oh, I'm out. I did it. I'm a doctor now. And of course, a lot of people, they have their perception of what a doctor should look like, where we should live, the cars we should be driving. And even um, a friend of mine at church, one time she took me aside and she said, Caroline, you should be driving a brand new BMW. But what she did not understand was that even with the pride and happiness of becoming, of finally becoming a doctor, there was a lot of frustration, anguish, anxiety, uncertainty, bitterness, and she didn't really understand that. And the reason why is because I was pretty much drowning in debt. I had $250,000 in student loans. And I must say, I did not really understand what I was signing when I was signing that much debt, especially the interest and the real purpose of debt. I really didn't understand that. And I was looking around and I kept seeing a bunch of dentists 15, 20, 25 years after um, graduating, they were still paying their debt. I said, that doesn't make sense. There has to be a better way. There has to be a way out of this. And of course, like most people do, I hired a financial advisor and I wasn't directly paying him. Um, I, I wasn't, he didn't have a fee. I wasn't paying him. I was all confused about that. But anyway, but in, during that time, my interest rates, my interest kept accruing. My student loan balance kept going up. I had a whole life insurance. I wasn't sure I even needed and to top it all off, I go to a friend's wedding in Baltimore. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous wedding. Probably like 350 guests. It was an Indian wedding. And if all of the people, they had their nice sari, some nice, um, you know, um, they had pretty much nice, there's a word for it, I forgot. But anyway, so they had the nice sari and everything like that at the wedding. And I said, people always say to eat crabs in Maryland. So I said, I had to have some egg bedded crab cakes. So I go ahead um, to up, upstairs at the hotel and order some egg Benedict crab cake. Delicious, <laughs> of course, delicious crab cake. And it's time to pay the bill. I pay the bill. Well, let me take that back. I gave my card and then the waiter comes back. Card was denied. 
Do you know how embarrassing that was? And again, like I said, it was a big Indian wedding. That was a friend from dental school. She had, she was marrying um, her fiance who had a PhD from MIT. So just to give you an idea, well-educated people, they have well-educated, well-to-do friends or in that area, in that restaurant, everybody was looking at me. That was embarrassing. I said, this is it. This is not a dream. I'm not going to live like this. I didn't spend an extra year trying to get into dental school to have that kind of life. And within four and a half years, I paid $250,000 in student loans. And my money, instead of paying Sally Mae, I'm paying, I'm investing, syndication, crowdfunding, real estate, the stock market, day trading. I'm paying cost cash. I'm helping my family financially. I prepay my vacations. I'm buying cost cash. It's, it's the best thing ever. It's financial freedom. I didn't have any stress during the pandemic. And I think the dentist should get into the program and do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know why Americans always recommend you buy a BMW? No, tell me. It's the only foreign car company they can spell. <laughs> and, but, BMW. But, but yeah, BMW. Um, um, but, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, I've, I've been out of dental school since 87. And every time I meet someone like you, I'm sorry to say this, but they're not born in the United States. They're always from Africa, the Caribbean, Asia. I mean, you go, you go to, I mean, I mean, this is, it sounds racist, but it's absolutely true. Um, you go to UAP, you go to San Francisco, they got UAP, they got two dental schools there, um, University of California, San Francisco, and UAP. If you were born in America, of any race, religion, ethnicity, whatever, you graduate from school and you go buy a BMW and you go get a nice uh, condo or a house or whatever and you go work for someone else and, and and they graduate at 25 and I come back and I catch up with them at 55 and they just upgraded their house to even bigger on a 30-year loan and as soon as they make their last payment on the BMW, they, they go finance a, a Range Rover for five years and then, and then you'll meet somebody um, there and um, she graduated from UAP, and she's not going to be a, a wage slave laborer for someone else. She's not going to go um, give up her means of production and, and be working for you. She goes and buys her own office. And um, I say, well, where's your car? Where, where, where's your house? She lives in the damn office. She doesn't have a house, and her iPhone is her patient care. You come back two years out of school, and she paid off or three years or four, she's paid off UAP. One of the one of these girls I was talking to even went had had to prove to me and went and showed me her cash. And I'm like, dude, you don't have this is insanity. She thought it was safer in her bedroom, in her closet, no. than in the bank. And and but the bottom line is um, every time I meet someone like that, 100% of the time, they were not born in the United States. And if a dentist was born in the United States and is not using other people's money mm-hmm. by, um, by say, 40, it, 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 they're, they're lying. I mean, it, mm-hmm. and, and if this isn't true, uh, and by the way, all I want for Christmas is you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel. But do tell me who you are debt free and then tell me where you're born. And so I'm now I got to ask you, were you born in the United States of America? I was, but I grew up in Haiti and I must say that's where and I got you're the all first of my... one. You're the first <laughs> one. Holy moly. You're the first one. I'll never forget this moment in life. But, but how young were you when you moved out of the country? Oh, so I grew up, so I grew up in Haiti and I came here when I was probably 19. So but you're um, born here, but they grew up there. Okay. Yes, pretty so much. Most of your so influence. My parents were here. My mom was is a doctor. She was taking some courses at Harvard. So, so I was born here. And then when everything was done with her training, we all went back to Haiti. Um, but again, a lot of money, what I know about money comes from my parents. They pretty much instilled all of those values in me. So I definitely see what you're saying as far as it might be, it must be a little bit cultural, but it can, those things can be learned. Again, the doctors that I work with, and when I should say doctors, I mean dentists, physicians, pharmacists, and vets. And oh my God, did you see teach- that in the news where Joe Biden's wife called herself a doctor? And the, I saw that. And the Neanderthal Cretan news team uh, said, uh, "Well, she's not a doctor." Well, I'm sorry that you're so dumb over there at Fox News that you don't know there's more than one kind of doctor. They're actually called a physician, you idiot. And and it's the same guy on Fox who, when he was um um 
interviewing the chairman of the reserve during the Mm -hmm. 2008 financial crisis who had a doctorate from MIT, uh, where that wedding uh, guest you were talking Mm -hmm. about. And and he he tells the guy, he refers to him by his first name, Mr. Bernanke. It's like, and, and then he tells him, that he goes on to tell him that he's never owned his own business. And then this guy, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's so insultory. I wish physicians would stop make, letting people call them doctor and call them a physician because <laughs> I'm, b- because in an era of fake yeah. news, if you're, I don't care if you're telling me about archaeology or mm-hmm. art history, it really means a lot to me that you got a PhD in it. But anyway, sorry about that. Sorry for interrupting, but, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, my gosh. But so you, there's a lot of doctors in your family. Yes. My mom is a doctor, my uncles, cousins. Yeah, we have a few. <laughs> we have a few, yes. You, you're saying that you learned the values of your money from your parents. Mm-hmm. And what I, what I see is that um, they can talk about some subjects scientifically. Then other ones are very emotional. And it seems mm-hmm. like money is so emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they yes. don't, they don't want to let you, they, they want you to think they're rich. So they, they lease a Beamer, mm-hmm. they live beyond their means because it's mm-hmm. part of their identity and self-esteem. And then mm-hmm. when you say, you're not really a Beamer boy, you're, you're a, you know, you're, you're a used Chevy boy mm-hmm. and you should be sitting on the bus. Uh, do, do, mm-hmm. do you think money, do you, do you think when they think money, it gets emotional? Oh, definitely. It's a very emotional thing. It's very emotional to be broke as well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but let me say, so growing up, our parents, or my parents, they always included my sister and I in financial decisions. And a lot of parents, they might think, oh, kids, you're a kid. You don't need to hear about money. But I think that really made it comfortable for me to talk about money. Um so at dinner table, my parents would be like, so we're thinking about buying a car. This is the car we're looking at. The budget that we have, there will be. And I was young, and I still remember that. And I think all oh, that has helped me to see, okay, this is how to use that. Because I must say that I have learned that the purpose of debt is to create wealth. If we are taking out debt for whatever it is, student loans, car note, furniture, you are creating debt. You're not creating debt if you are paying that monthly payment every month. You're creating debt for someone else. Again, it's very important for a new dentist to understand that. The purpose of debt is to create wealth. It's very, very important to understand that. Once you understand that, everything changes. For me, that really helped. Uh, I love that. I mean, I love that. Um, well, you've been on Dental Town a long time. You got a lot of posts. What do you, what do you think the average dentist on Dental Town um, thinks about um, getting out of debt. Do you think it's like a, a top goal or do you think it's um, on? It know, depends. It depends. I must say that it depends as far as their goals, their long-term goals. At some point you have to be fed up. If you're not fed up, you're just going to be pretty much putting um, the student loans in the back burner. So if, for example, I have a few clients, they are only doing IBR, which is um, income-based repayment. And other ones, they just con- um, pretty much consolidate the loans and just pay 600 a month towards their debt. And then 20 years after, they are owing more than they had that they had originally. Um, they were they were or, that they originally had to pay back, and it's just not a priority for them. And some people they say like, I'll just die with my loans. I'll just die with my student loans. I'll rather invest the money in mortgages or focus on paying my credit cards and other stuff like that. And so for some people, it's not a priority until you become fed up. And for me, that's what happened. I I was just fed up. I was like, I don't need this. 7% interest. I can just refinance this. No, I don't need need to do this. So, you know, you, um, you made a post on, um, says best financial decision you have ever made. And this mm-hmm. is a big thread because um, they're talking about, uh, you said, hey, I was able to refinance with First Republic Bank. I think mm-hmm. that's the only way I was able to pay out my student loans in four and a half years. Mm-hmm. That And listening partially to Dave Ramsey, mm-hmm. um, call him, feel free to um, private message you for more details. And when you when I see that um, Dave Ramsey, I mean, he's from mm-hmm. uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I lost our... 
Dentistry lost the great one from Chattanooga, Tennessee. RIP to Dr. John Thomas McSpadden, um, who's on show 410. Probably the biggest world-renowned endodontist uh, that affected me out of Chattanooga. A lot of great things in Chattanooga. Chattanooga and, uh, my gosh, Dave Ramsey. So, um, did you, what would you say? I mean, the number one question these kids come out with out of school is, would you refinance your student loans? Absolutely. However, you need to know when to refinance. Your debt to income ratio is something the lenders look at. It needs to be at 40% or less. You might have a, an incredible credit score, a great salary, and still get denied. Or the banks might ask you to get a co-signer. You don't need to mess with that. What was that ratio? Sure debt to 40%. income? 40%. Your debt to income ratio need to be 40% or less. For my clients, I, I want it to be closer to 25, 30% because I want them to get approved and have the best rate. But some banks, they'll definitely approve you if it's 40% or less. Again, closer to 20%, that's ideal. And, and, and closer to 20%. Need- so, so if you made a dollar a year in income, how much debt could you have? If you make a dollar well, a well, year, well, I'm, well, they're they're coming out of school. They're they're coming out of school with four hundred thousand dollars of student loans. So mm-hmm. just to be clear to them, if you say debt but, to income ratio is forty percent or less, if their student loan debt is four hundred thousand, um, how much would they have? To but be that's making? the thing. What kind of what other debt do they have? Because some of them they have they're adding mortgages to that. They have credit cards. So we have to look at all that. Okay. So it's yeah. very important to just not look at the student loans, but again, it's not a good situation if you if you go ahead and apply and you do not get approved, because all that can go in your credit report and becomes a mess. You don't need that, right? So if they had four hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt and mm-hmm. they had to have a debt to income ratio of forty percent, forty percent of four hundred thousand is one hundred and sixty. So they would have to be making one hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year um, yes. to get the best ratio. I mean, yes. get the best interest mm-hmm. rate. And what yes. kind of interest rates are most kids coming out with on their student loans? And what can a lot of them refinance that to? There are so many banks that they can use. Um, personally, I use First Republic, but you they don't have to use that. Um, but again, the thing with First Republic is that you have to live close to the bank, meaning you cannot be in New Hampshire and try to refinance with them. For me, I was in Boston during that time, so that's why it was easy. But you need to be, so you, if you have a, a rate that's probably seven, between seven or nine percent, you should be able to go all the way down to 3.5 percent. That should be your goal. Okay, less than 3.5 percent. So First Republic Bank, um, that's just one that you uh, you like? Or um, have they been fans of dentistry? I shouldn't say I like it. It's just that that's the only bank that had the very low interest, meaning I was able to go from 7.9% to 1.97%. That's low. You were able to go from what to what? Say that again. 7.9% to 1.97%. That's low. 7.9 to 1.9? Mm-hmm. Wow, but again, that my is, debt to uh, income ratio was solid. Seven point nine to one point nine is where you mm-hmm, move from. Mm-hmm. Um, and since I've had geometry, I know that's six percent less. I mean, that's uh, that's. And, but negative. again, most of them, there's lower world, um, common bond, so Sophie or Sophia, however you call it. Um, there's so many of them, um, but average, my clients are getting about three point two percent, three point five percent. Yes. But again, here's the thing too. Um, you do you can refinance many times. You do not. It's not like refinancing your house where you have closing costs and it's annoying. It's a little bit easier to refinance um, your student loans, meaning and there's no fee. Okay. And something else that I want to mention, um, people always ask me about consolidation. Is it's a little bit? I shouldn't say it's a little bit. It's different from refinancing. Consolidation only has to do with federal loans. Refinancing is when you're um, refinancing either private loans or you're refinancing your, f- your federal loans to private loans. And it's very important to understand the difference. Consolidation, you're mostly going to see your monthly payments going down, and which means it's going to be prolonging you repaying your debt, as opposed to refinancing your loans, which is what the purpose is to decrease um, the interest rate 
but at the same time, your monthly payment is actually going to be higher because the goal is for you to pay off the student loans faster. So um, you, you were talking about family values with your sitting around with your mom and dad and all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, I, 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 those bring back warm memories to me sitting around the table, my mom and dad mm-hmm. uh, doing jello shots of Jameson whiskey. Um, but how would you, how, wh- Talk about limiting beliefs about, around debt, money, and wealth um, management. I mean, sometimes I don't know if they have fear of success or fear of loss. I mean, like patience. Some people are um, incentivized by greed to like, I want, I want whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. But some people go to the dentist, and I mean like half the country that they're going to the dentist because they're fear of loss. They're like, I don't want to get gum disease and lose my teeth. And and the um, psychologist, you know, I went to um, ASU, and um, there was a guy there, a big guy that wrote a book on um, um, oh, uh, um, persuasion and, and all that kind of stuff, just a, a big guru. And he, he talks about it. Um, you're, we share a planet with 8 billion people and 4 billion people are probably just thinking, I don't want to lose something. And the other four people are like, um, I'll, I'll risk it. I, I want to gain something. But um, what, what, what do you think are the limiting beliefs around debt, money, and wealth? Uh, well, a few that I've seen, I'll, I will always have debt. To me, you're already telling yourself that it doesn't matter what you do, you always have debt. It doesn't matter if you have an option to refinance, if you have an option for some kind of loan payment program, no, I'll always be out of, I'll always be in debt. Another one is I have to work hard for my money. And even me, I must say, I used to believe that I have to work hard for my money. Um, millionaires are not working hard for their money right now. I'll, I'll tell you guys that. <laughs> Another one is I have to pay off my debt in 25 years. I have to, it's going to take me a long time to pay off my debt. No, it does not have to take all that. It really does not have. You just need the, the right strategies and to know how to use debt, how to move your money around pretty much. So those are some limiting beliefs that I have been seeing with doctors. But again, the, the one, most of them believe that they'll always be out of, they'll always be in debt. It doesn't matter. They're always going to have a credit card, some credit cards. They're always going to have mortgages. They're always going to have car notes they just think it's part of their life and for me it doesn't have to be like that you know uh think of how we will beat every month to be getting passive income every month you have rental properties and every month you're getting the passive income from that if you're day trading if you have some time to do day trading if you're investing in the stock market if you have vending machines somewhere or atm machines somewhere um just think of it like that or putting just putting your money in some in an IRA, whatever it is, it, that's a better use of your money. OK, it's, but again, sometimes when you have those limiting beliefs, it just like the name entails limits you. Yeah. And uh, my gosh, um, some of them around here are uh, driving me crazy. Like someone will tell you, OK, so they they. Um, you know, well, you know, God, you said so many profound things. I got so many things I want to talk about. I mean, my God, um, you said the purpose of debt is to create wealth. Yes. She's talking about investing in something that makes money, um, yes. investing in your house and your boat and your car and your vacation. And I mean, that is consumption. I mean, um, and, and, and it makes sense because think about this. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of kids could have uh, got a job at McDonald's for $10 an hour and work for 10 years to save up to go to dental school in cash. Mm-hmm. But they borrowed other people's money, OPM, mm-hmm. went to dental school and then paid it back, not Ten dollars an hour at McDonald's, but a hundred dollars an hour at a doctor. So debt is leverage. I mean, you mm-hmm. can leverage your way up, but that's not Absolutely. how dentists use debt. They their debt is on a four thousand square foot home, a three carat diamond ring, a Range Rover, a vacation to Hawaii. They just spend, spend, spend. But again, so let me say that before I forget, it's okay to spend money on luxury stuff, but to me. And when I see millionaires and what they do, they use money that they have invested. So money from the investments to buy those luxurious stuff. So let's say that you get a rental um, income. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. You can either use that or if some people, they use physician's loan, they get a multifamily property, they live in one unit, they rent out the other ones. Every month you can get a thousand dollars. That's money that you can just use and pay and put towards something else. So something towards something luxurious. So you don't have to use your money 
your hard earned money to pretty much buy stuff that don't really bring you value, just pleasure. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 you know, uh, um, whenever I hear someone getting slammed, I always think, well, wh- where is that coming from? And it's like a law. No matter how dumb a law is, it comes from a scar. Somebody really felt scarred, you know, so they wrote a law. And it might have been 100 years ago, and it may not apply now. But um, um, I, I just want to remind you of some of the scars I've seen. Um, the Y2K run up from uh, 1994 to the end of 2000. Um, I saw about 80, I think it was 86 dental offices just lost everything. And some of these dentists, I, I would talk to them, I'm like, well, come come on, let's let's do something. Like, you know, you, you got all the, you got several cars. Let's sell off some cars. They were all leased. Um, well, you bought a house for 1.1 million. Mm-hmm. Let's downsize that. Oh, well, then he took an $800,000 loan on the house and, and added a swimming pool and a tennis court and this and that. And you're sitting there listening to these dentist stories and you're like, Okay, am I missing something? Or are you like a rock star or an athlete? Or do you play for the Raiders on Sunday? Because I've never seen a dentist live like this. And then in the stock market, they weren't buying shares of stock. They were doing the, uh, what is it called when you only have to have margin calls? They were only buying 10% of the stock to buy it and hold it and play in shorts. And I'm like, okay, okay, you you spent eight years becoming a dentist, and now you're playing with the boys on Wall Street with borrowed <laughs> money? And and I'm sm- and then I saw it in Lehman's Day in, in August 15, 2008. Same damn thing. Mm. And, and, and I want to tell you another thing. Um, limited liability partnerships, what that means is you have limited, um, limited profits – and maximum liability if it goes over. So if four dentists go, and I saw this, four dentists in my state, um, we're going to do a condominium golf course development. And I'm like, okay, who who here comes from a long line of condominium golf course development? Was it your dad, your mom, your sister? No one. They're just dentists. They're like, hey, dude, I'm a dentist. I'm the smartest one in the room. So the four of them mortgaged everything got a $10 million loan at the top of the real estate market in 2008. They couldn't even give that thing away for half a million and four for four walked away bankrupt. And I'm just sitting here like, um, man, borrowed money. And and I don't care what anybody says. And I'm not going to ask you what your opinion is because I know um, um, no one wants to uh, predict the future. But my gosh, this smells like... Y2K, this smells like Lehman Brothers Day. I mean, I look at the price earnings rates of these stocks. I look at, and, and, and the market goes crazy. Like at the tops of the market, I've always noticed that people, you know, you're selling your house for $100. And, and, and you say, well, I might not get it out of 100 So I'm going to offer 110 It's like, have you ever seen someone walk on a car lot and the used car salesman says, this car is $1,000. Well, I'll offer 1200 It's like. Or what are what are you drinking? Yeah. Will you please? I mean, and and it's, it's so you need these crazy stories to justify like what you're doing. And I don't care what anybody says because when I took my first business class at Creighton University in 1980, it was in Omaha, Nebraska, and the the dean of the business school had his buddy Warren come over. Nobody in the room knew who he was. No one was impressed. We were all too young and dumb. But he did teach us the the Buffett Index where he says, okay, within a given country, here's the United States. He goes, of all the publicly traded companies, the Russell 5000 or the Russell 2000 or whatever, he says, um, 85% of the economy is small business, 25 employees or less. So we're only talking 15% of the whole economy. So that 15% of the whole economy, it sure as hell can't be worth more than the entire GDP. And then he shows us how the GDP is here. And when the stock values below that, they come back up and they go too high, it comes back down. And, and sometimes it gets really out of whack and goes up to like 110, 115%. Dude, it's at 181% right now. A hundred and eighty-one percent right now. Then there's that other thing, price earnings ratio. Okay, I buy a stock and the dividend, the, the profit, the earnings of the company, it takes you know about six years to pay it back. And historically, when my ancestors couldn't get out of Ireland, um, and they would um, sell themselves as indentured servants, and they say, Okay, we'll bring you to Argentina, United States, middle, you know, wherever, but you work for me for six years. 
Well, well, they. What if they right now Tesla's at a hundred years earnings? What if I came up to you and said, "Well, I'll give you a free trip to America, but you got to work free for me for one century." You're like one century. I mean, did you say one second? I mean, so right now, to to I mean, right now, one share of Bitcoin mm-hmm. could buy you five thousand barrels of oil and a new car. Are are you stoned out of your mind? I mean, um, so I. I, I, well, I will ask you, is it getting a little irrational, yes, exuberant? It is. it is. It really is. So and I think that's when sometimes, too, it's we shouldn't be making financial decisions based on fear or any kind of emotions. Sometimes you just have to relax, <laughs> take a deep breath, reassess. It's very important not to make financial decisions when you are freaking out or uh, anything like that. And a lot of people did that during the pandemic. So, and I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but... Um, Definitely, it's it's getting. Well, well, let's talk about the crazy. pandemic. Did that um did that um change anything? Um, did did that did that change you? I mean, and when you're talking about um your business, by the way, um the website, it's um doctorsoutofdebt.com, mm-hmm. and it cost one hundred thousand dollars of debt to join the website. <laughs> wow, I did not see that coming. I'm, I am shocked at that. Uh, but um, so if they want to contact you, doctorsoutofdebt.com, mm-hmm. is that the best way? Doctor, yes, that's their easiest way, yes. That's their easiest way? Okay. Yes. And, and everything's um, there. If they need to work with me, um, doctorsoutofdebt.com, um, upper right corner, work with me, or they can send me a message. Yes. And okay. I respond, always respond. So so did, this, did the pandemic... Um, because you know what doesn't kill you make you stronger. What what has your um, doctors out of debt? Has anything changed since uh, the pandemic? Do, yes, do you see I'm anything getting busier. Different? <laughs> you're, you're getting busier, and, and why I, is that? Because people are realizing that they need to be out of debt and they need to have multiple streams of income. You cannot just rely on one income, and at the same time, debt is like the middleman. It doesn't matter. What you do, if you have debt, you're going to keep, or I mean, when I say debt, I mean the six-figure debt, you're going to keep having the negative net worth. So you need to get out of debt and um, to be able to start creating the wealth, meaning with the passive income. So uh, it's been busier, definitely. During the pandemic, clients paying seven credit cards in two months, their credit score going from 764 to 817 in just right now, I'm talking right now, um, Ten thousand dollars paid towards college tuition, or oh, I had a pharmacy that I work with. One hundred seventeen thousand dollars that she paid off in twenty four months. Those things can get done, but again, you need to have your goals. Write down your goals. Know what you want. Why do you want to be out of that? It's very, very important to know why you want to be out of that, because being out of that is just. It's not the end goal. What is your end goal? It's very important to know why you want to be out of debt. Is it to have financial freedom? Most people, that's what they want. Well, that's what I wanted. Is it to pay for your um, kid's tuition? Is it to buy BMW? <laughs> what is, you know, what is it? So it's very important to know why you want to be out of debt. But again, yeah, I've been very busy um, during the pandemic. And I'm you know just why to- I didn't. You know why I didn't pay off my uh, credit card during the pandemic? You did not. Well, you know why me. though? Because the thief was spending less than my wife. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not letting that guy get out of there. He, he, he can have it. And, and, but I want, I want to, um, I want to say, uh, I, you know, this, this quote. I, I hate to say this quote um, three days before Christmas. I mean, I, I hope my mom isn't listening to this one. Uh, she'll have a heart attack. But you know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, you should. Uh, change out all your friends every 10 years. And and what I'd say is if you're going uphill, I'd say hell no. But if you're going downhill, you might think about it because misery loves company mm-hmm. and there's two groups of dentists. Um, and I'm in both groups because one drinks beer at the bar and and they can't find anything right with dentistry and it sucks mm-hmm. and the insurance companies and all that stuff. But man, they like beer and they like yeah. football. And, mm-hmm. and, and then there's other ones 
um, who, man, they get together and they're just all energy and it's all productive. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, um, you know, they've always said that you're a product of the five people you hang around mm -hmm. with the most. It's and, true. uh, and a lot of people get after they got, you know, they were so afraid of getting divorced, paying all that alimony. And then they realized, <laughs> my God, well, if I would have stayed married to her, I mean, the alimony was like a going out of business sale. I got rid of that mm -hmm. one for 20 cents on the dollar. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of dentists. I mean, this, I was at dinner, you know, how many times I've been at dinner and I said, so what do you do? And they go, oh, I'm a stay home mother. It's like, dude, your kids graduated from college. What the hell are you, are you still washing their diapers? I mean, they're, I mean, they just justify anything. And, yeah. and it's like, um, really. And, and I, um, and by the way, I've had, uh, I've had some, um, some of my friends, wives will never talk to me again, simply because I told their husband that I said, the only thing I can figure out your wife does is destroys $10,000 of capital a month. And uh, so if you married her at 25 by, by 65, she's destroyed about $5 million where if you would have married any girl in dental school, just pick the worst girl in dental school. She would have made $10,000 a month, 40 years. That's a $10 million difference between mm -hmm. your wife and the worst girl in your class. And I always um, say and, that and, one and, of the and, best, and, go ahead. Oh, well, the, the number one cause of divorce is marriage. Mm -hmm. And the number one cause of, a stu of uh, putting your kids through college is having a kid. And everybody everybody that talks about money management never talks about the two most important things. If you don't get married, you won't get uh, divorced, and if you don't have any kids, you won't have to save up for their college. So just stay <laughs> single forever and never make a baby or oh get gosh. married. Is that, that what is you so recommend? Funny. That is so funny. But did you, you know, get married? Said, did you get married and make a baby? I did. Well, then you <laughs> can't be a financial advisor if you're pro marriage and children. But this, you know, I always say the biggest, or maybe one of the biggest financial decisions that you make is who you marry. It's so important to have someone from with whom we have fi similar financial views. Don't just marry to be married, because a lot of my clients, they are one of them had to go to bankruptcy because of how ugly the divorce got, and another one she got divorced and then fell into a depression. Some and then it's it can get very messy. So it's very important to choose your mate wisely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but well, let's talk about that because when you look at, um, I mean, when, when people say things, I mean, you got to realize that, you know, you have the present. I always put that on the, uh, the X axis. And then you got 5,000 years of recorded history, which is just Polaroid pictures in a box under your bed. They're not really tied into the present. And you, you sit there and you um, you look back, and uh, doctors, dentists, lawyers, they owe oh, um, women. Always marry up, and men oh, would have to marry down. I mean, it, in all cultures of all histories, um, you go to India, the the the, the untouchable is trying to. If she's hot and sexy, she's trying to catch a Brahma, right? <laughs> and if you're on the wrong side of the tracks and you see some guy on the other side of the track, so women leverage their, I mean, in, in the peacock of beauty, they're they're the beautiful ones. They marry up. And and I, I go to the um guys in dental school and the women. In dental school, they all married. Uh, it's, it's like a third of them married another dentist in their class, mm -hmm. and the rest all married lawyers, mm -hmm. physicians, accountants. And then, yeah. and then the dentist, I mean, he could be the smartest guy in the class, and he marries the waitress from the Waffle House <laughs> because she was so hot. And I'm like, uh, hey, how's that hot Waffle House chick working for you? And so they're, they're, the, the, the trade is, hey, hey, nerdo. You would never get all this. So if you're going to get this, I ain't working. I'm driving a Range Rover. I'm mm -hmm. driving a big house, a big car. So all my women friends that are dentists, they're all married to income equivalents. Mm -hmm. All my dentist friends are married to crazy ladies <laughs> that just destroy $10,000 a month. And I don't care if, you, if it sounds sec. I don't care what you think it is, because whatever you think it is, is not nearly as bad as that poor guy living through it. And um, so, so when the marriage is based on, hey, you're going to buy all this hottie hot with a lot of cash. I mean, do you, do you see that or do you not see that? I do. And it's sad because, again, divorce is expensive. You know, it's, it can really destroy you financially. So if you can avoid that and, but sometimes people, they're like, oh, I never saw it coming. But a lot of people, they're like, I saw the signs. I, I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, 
yeah, it's so important to choose wisely. Really. And, and the the alimony thing. What an yes, what an illegal yes, racket. Yes. Really? Absolutely. I mean if I mean I I, I I don't want to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but if anybody ever wants to get elected to the presidency in one minute, just say that when you get there, you're gonna scrap all alimony. Oh my God! He'd probably <laughs> there'd probably be more votes than people in the whole country. I mean, crazy, crazy. So, so you agree that misery loves company, and yes. if you're going downhill, is your spouse dragging you, or your kids pushing you down the hill, and then you Usually. go to the bar and 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 drink beer with other people in misery versus, um, and that's another thing in politics, you know, they're always saying, you know, for 30 years, people say, well, they should just tell those people on Social Security that that they're taking everything out that they've put in in three and a half years, and they're living 10 more. Uh, really? So you want one guy to tell that to the whole country? Well, why don't you turn around and tell your wife, Muffy, to get a job? <laughs> I mean, you can't tell Muffy to get a job. And you want the president to tell a hundred million people to get a job, and then you look at then you look at the research. You look at the research on on uh, senior citizens. Thirty eight percent say they're lonely. Well, why are they living alone? Because you're subsidizing them on borrowed money that they didn't contribute to Social Security. Then you look at the everyone working. Well, what is your biggest problem? Daycare. I got a solution. We're nineteen trillion in debt. We're broke. Why don't we cancel your mom's social security? Then she'll have to move in with you. And then you got a babysitter. And then she's not lonely. And little little grandchildren. I got seven grandchildren from from thirteen to one month. And I guarantee you, the coolest thing besides your mom and dad is grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. And my gosh, um, I love to sit around and uh, read them bedtime stories until their mom mm -hmm. makes them go to bed because I. Uh, I kind of changed the stories around a little bit. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, I said, um, um, they say, uh, you know what we're going to do for Christmas Eve? You know that, that uh, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I know what we're going to do for Christmas. The next time the ice cream truck drives by, we're going to get on our <laughs> no. bikes and follow them all the way home. And then on Christmas Eve... We're going to go over there and steal the ice cream truck <laughs> and drive it all the way back to Grandpa's house. And we'll have That's all so the funny. ice cream we ever want. Grandma's like, okay, time to go to bed, kids. That's too funny. But, yeah. um, so, so, yeah, so, I mean, if you're really, you know if your marriage is falling off a cliff that you you get, you get change out your, your spouse. Well, it's the same with your friends. Mm -hmm. I think when you're not happy and you're living above your means, I think it's very likely that misery loves companies and you're surrounded with a bunch of people with an entirely wrong attitude on life and money and wealth. So usually your friends or your close friends, you guys are making, we have similar salaries, driving similar cars, living in similar neighborhoods. You go to, you travel similar countries. So it's very important if you, there, uh, there's a particular lifestyle that you do not want for yourself, do not associate yourself with certain people. But again, it doesn't mean to just shut down, like shut them down or close the door on them. No, but just limit your interaction with them, you know? And because even for me, when I was going to my debt repayment journey, I had to cut a few people loose. I mean, cut them off. What's the expression? Cut them off. Cut them um, off, cut them loose. Yes, cut them, yes exactly. I, I just bury them in the backyard, but that's... <laughs> I had that's to, a, um, just because they thing. were so negative. And because even at the beginning, I was negative myself. You know, I used to think negatively about money, people who have money, you know. And if you are surrounding yourself with people who think like that, you're just going to be going downhill with them. No. Surround yourself with mentors, coaches, people who are inspiring you to be who you want to be like. Like people, do you want to be a millionaire by a certain age do you want to create wealth for your kids you know all those things so surround yourself with people who have done that or who are in the process of doing that it's very very important and because um and in, in in arizona i mean i've um i've ran into this where the um the dentist is unemployed and he's like i'm mm -hmm. like really you can't find a job anywhere and they go no i mean i mean i've been offered at this like medicaid clinic on the wrong part of town for like mm -hmm. you know blah, blah, and i'm like Wow, you're so entitled. You just came out of a dental school where due to COVID-19, you only worked on mannequins. Um, <laughs> you haven't even done a live 
root canal patient mm. and you turn down a Medicaid job because in your psyche, you mm. wanted to, I mean, what did you, what did you want to be the, the, yep. the, you know, I mean, my gosh. It, and it seems like, um, and, and I always saw this when I was growing up, half the kids could find three jobs any day they ever looked and the other half could never find a job. And that is just satisfaction equals perception minus expectation. One wanted to find a job, and one wanted to find some job that didn't exist. And then another thing I noticed is that when I opened up my practice, I was so lucky because there was a guy named Ed Seltzer, and he owned four. He owned, like, the first group practice. You might even have called it a mini. I don't like the word DSO because it starts off solo practice. It goes to group practice, which I thoroughly love group practice more than mm -hmm. I only I only did solo not even a year and I wanted a friend in there I mean it's it's boring <laughs> I mean you go from dental school to all by yourself that's mm -hmm. not very fun and then a group practice goes to a few locations but anyway I opened up my practice and and when it was under construction he had four sunshine dental clinics and they were open seven to seven seven days a week he let me work and no one would Take, no one would let me work for him because I had an office going and they knew when I opened, I was going to try to sell their patients. Ed said, I, I don't live in fear. And, um, and he let me work seven to seven, seven days a week. So every month or week I was doing my dental school though. And then when I opened, whenever I wasn't open, I jump in my car after work and drive back to Sunshine Dental and Ed let me work and, and just work, work, work. And there's just a lot of people that won't do a side hustle. They, I mean, I mean, I'm like, I, I, and then you say, well, this, this doctor on the other side of town is looking for a hygienist on Saturday. Why don't you go be his hygienist on Saturday for $40 an hour? Well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm like, where where does that come from? Are you lazy or stupid? I mean, which which? So talk about that. I mean, do you, first of all, do you agree with that? Do you see that? Absolutely. And but for me, I am the kind of person I never ever had one job. Even when I was in college, I always had multiple jobs. Uh, so when I had graduated from dental school, I work at a health center, and. The benefit, I guess, of working at a health center is that you can apply for a loan repayment program. So I had that. So I had the salary and I had the loan repayment program and something else to do with having positive mindset, um, surrounding yourself with positive people and all that. Out of nowhere, a dental assistant comes to me and says that, oh, there's, they're looking for a dentist to work on military members. Are you interested? They, I heard they pay pretty well. I said, sign me up. So here, three jobs already, you know, so, and I use all that to be able to pay the debt. And I'm not saying dentists should do that or, or when they are after graduation, but it's good to sometimes at the beginning to be open to opportunities because sometimes opportunities can become bigger opportunities, you know, that can definitely open other doors. And so... Uh, I'm sorry. And another thing is when I got out of school, I mean, there was no pandemic. Well, the, the, the AIDS, the HIV just started and mm -hmm. I got out of school in 87. So I lived, this is my second virus radio and that HIV went on to kill 36 million people. And it was just a atrocity. <sighs> um, but um, w w without a pandemic, mm -hmm. I was able to, um, the requirements were 75 fillings, uh, 50 extractions, 15 canals of endo and 15 units of denture. So an upper and lower denture B2. And um, my gosh, um, I, I come out of that thing. And um, when you do or side gigs, um, you know, you, especially in group practice DSOs, like I would just was only good enough to pull out the top half of the tooth. And then one of the other doctors in the clinic would have to come pull out the bottom half. I was really good at <laughs> extracting crowns, but then I'd have to get my buddy, my buddy Nagish Gidwani, and and he and he was so nice. He's so loving. He just looked at me like he was like trying to keep me motivated. Like you keep going, Howie, and he'd pop out the root in like one millisecond. I mean, it was just like you know, and 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 then doing that on your own patients is not really a practice builder, but I'll remember one time, um, it was just recently, maybe, uh, in the last five or 10 years, I looking at a root canal and I thought, what idiot did that root canal? I mean that this is like the worst root canal. He should have his license. Take. I mean, was he drunk? And my assistant <laughs> says to me, um, Howie, you did that in 1987. And I thought, Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I have never seen such horrible work. 
and it was my own. So getting a side gig, and like if you're afraid of molar income, well, if you are got a side gig in a group practice where if you can't find the MB2, some older guy <laughs> will find it in one millisecond. If you can't get out a root tip, somebody who's not, you know, didn't have a head injury. I assume I had a concussion. I, I at, at this part of my life, I assume I played in the NFL when I was so young uh, that I don't remember it. Uh, but I mean, my gosh, just uh, just go work. And that is the one thing I notice on on money is if um, when you have a part time job, like when you work Monday through Thursday, eight to five, and you're off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Friday, you're bored. You go golf. Saturday, you're bored. Then Sunday, you decide you're going to go to Home Depot and start a redo my bathroom project for five grand. And when I was working every day, seven to seven, um, and uh, seven to seven, seven days a week for four months until my office got open. And then whenever my office wasn't open, still finishing till the 7 p.m. and on the Sundays and all that kind of stuff, you don't have time to spend any money. Mm-mm. It's like this pandemic. Look with this pandemic. Yes. Look how much this pandemic showed you how much money you don't have to spend. Mm-hmm. And in fact, my wife actually found the oven. She had no idea. <laughs> That's where I used to hide everything from her because I knew she would never find the oven. But I mean, this I think this pandemic has showed you that you don't need to do no. everything you used to do. And to go back to the money, to the side jobs. So when I was in a Tufts during my the fourth year, I believe. I work as a hygienist because Massachusetts they allow you after your third year to apply for your um, hygiene license. So I did that, so I worked as a hygienist. And it was very nice to do because I got to see different offices and they were paying me $40 an hour. And of course that money, I used it um, um, well, I should say. And But I think it's important to always have a side gig. And that side gig either in form of active income meaning you're actively working, you're giving your time and then you get your salary or some kind of money, so salary or passive income. So it's always good to have something on the side that you do in addition to your, in addition to dentistry, since I'm talking to dentists today. <laughs> um, another um, question they always ask, and I want to know what you thought of this, is they, um, they say, well, I'm not going to start savings for retirement because Ooh. I still have student loans. Um, and and that's I mean that I mean I I, I get there can the, the question there so how would you answer that question? It really depends. If you really really want to be very very aggressive, meaning pay off your debt in three to four years, it's okay. If you don't pay anything, it's meaning you should be able to make that up. You know. However, the best time to start saving for retirement is at birth, when you have a social security number. Your parents should be saving for retirement for you already. Have the custodial and 529 accounts open. And when you when you start working, you have an IRA. Don't wait until you have your dentist to open an IRA. No, that's too late. The when as far as retirement, time is on your side, meaning the earlier you start, the better. Don't wait until the last minute. But again, if you think you're going to be very, very aggressive to pay off the debt, maybe you can try for three years not to pay anything. But for me, um, I still um, invested in retirement when I was paying off the debt. I wasn't aggressive, but I still maxed uh, my IRA, definitely. And again, I I cannot say that enough. Retirement saving needs to be started at birth. And really, that's why your parents really have a responsibility to put you in a position where you can have a financial freedom early, good retirement, all that. It seems to me that um, when you start looking at passive income, my God, Dennis have everybody. I, I used to always sit um, next to, um, you know, when I was lecturing staff, you know, I was always on airplanes. I'd always turn to people and say, um, and I, and I, um, I wouldn't say, what do you think of Dennis? They say, are you a dentist? And I'll say, if you were to describe, like, say a lawyer, a physician, a dentist, how would you describe them? Then I let us see which one they pick, and it's never us. We're only 5% of doctors, and usually it's lawyers or something. And then I say, well, okay, well, then how would you describe a dentist? And, they, you know, they're always going to say, oh, they, they love golf, they have banker's hours, they got a nice job, all that. But, dude, they love real estate. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. like... It seems like every dentist I know, they love golf, 
and they and, <laughs> and, and and for their passive income they like real estate. First of all, where does that come from? And do you like that? Do you like golf and real estate? I'm not sure where it's coming from, to be honest with you. Golf, it's nice, yes. Uh, but real estate definitely. And everybody should invest in real estate, period. Everybody. Because that's the okay, so I always say that. Millions of millionaires have become millionaires because of real estate. If you want to become a millionaire, do what the millionaires do, invest in real estate. Even people who are heavily or who have heavily invested in the stock market or other type of investments, they all have real estate investments. And when I say invest in real estate, I don't mean your primary residence. You don't want to spend all your money in your primary residence. No, I'm talking about syndication, crowdfunding, having buildings somewhere, rental properties, that's going to give you the income every month. A lot of doctors, they tend to have expensive houses and all that takes away from your from money that you could be using towards investment or retirement. And um, you mentioned um, Dave Ramsey in some mm-hmm. of your posts. Um, talk about that. Um, and it's funny, Dave Ramsey, I encountered Dave Ramsey the year, the last year that I was paying off my debt. I wish I knew about him before. Uh, so it was pretty late, I should say, in my debt repayment. And someone, so I started um, commuting a lot. My drive was an hour, an hour and a half. And I started looking for podcasts. That's how it started. And he, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> so, so, so you like him? He, as far as debt repayment, absolutely. Absolutely. As, as far he as debt repayment? He's definitely, he definitely gives great advice. Absolutely. Yes. Huh, but again, that, personal finance is personal. You need to know your numbers. You need to know your goals, you know, because not everybody has the same. We don't have the same goals. What it, a lot of it has to go around what your financial goals are. Insurance is the same thing. You know, um, there's term life, there's whole life, this mm-hmm. and that. Um, um, but some people, some people look at insurance. They think, ah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to walk the high wire and try to save me some money. Um, what do you, what do you think about, um, um, just insurance in general and how to protect yourself and your assets, um, uh, with proper mm-hmm. insurance? So, uh, one of my clients is a disabled dentist. Just imagine having, going from six figure income to just relying on disability income. It's very important to have disability insurance. Um, make sure that's own occupation and that, whatever um, policy you have that is going to cover all your expenses, student loans, um, credit cards, car notes, whatever expenses that you have that is all going to be covered. Life insurance, if you don't have any kids, you don't have anybody relying on you, on your income, you don't need to have life insurance. But if you have people relying on you, definitely you need some kind of life insurance. And on average, they say it should be 10 times your income as far as you're trying to decide how much to take out. And most people are going to tell you, yes, term life over whole life insurance, yes. But, and even during the pandemic, some people, they've had some identity theft issues. It's good to have identity theft protection. So I always say disability insurance, um, term life insurance, identity theft protection, a will, an estate plan. You need to have all those things. And it's not expensive, but at the same time, you don't want, so let's say, so if you, um, unfortunately, a few doctors, they passed away of, because of coronavirus and they didn't even have a will in place. It's, you don't want your family to, trying to fight with the government no, or the state as far as where your money should be going. No, have a will. It's, and it's simple to, to make one. It's very simple. So it's very important all that time that you spend studying for board exams, um, all that energy, whatever it is, um, to become a dentist, Protect it all. Protect your assets. It's very, very important. I cannot stress that enough. And I know sometimes if someone might feel like, oh, it's not worth it. It's too expensive. Again, I'm working with clients and one of them, she's a disabled dentist. And it's been hard going from six finger income to disability income. And she still has student loans credit cards, car notes, and all that. And she graduated maybe 20 years ago. Okay. So just to give you an idea and protect your assets, protect your assets, protect yourself. 
Well, you know, there's, I mean, I, I couldn't even believe um, the the famous uh, people who have died without a yes. will. I mean, uh, um, I mean, whenever my grand, you know, when I was playing dolls with my uh, granddaughter yesterday and she was being Elsa and she said, Grandpa, um, if you had to be a prince, who would be your prince? And I said, Prince Rogers, uh, Rogers Nelson, Prince, you know, that's that's my prince. And I, I'm trying to get her to go play uh, um, the uh, Prince songs in 1999 and Little Red Corvette. Uh, but the bottom line is, Prince didn't have a will. I mean, Aretha Franklin didn't have a will. And then the one that blew my mind, Abraham Lincoln didn't have a will. So, um, yeah, I mean... Um, yeah, we're, Dennis do some crazy things, but l- let me say, let me, let me. I, I'm going to ask you that, and, and I know we've gone over an hour, and you're probably starting to pray that uh, I shut up and let you go soon. But um, you know, during this um, pandemic, mm-hmm. there's a lot of solid evidence that mental illness has gone up, suicide, mm-hmm. domestic violence, and things like that. And how much less stress do you think these people that are stressed out of their mind would have had if they were debt free? Um, bought their cars in cash, um, you know, uh, prepaid their vacations. Uh, when they, um, when their family members ask uh, for money, you help them get a classified ads in front of them. You know, you, um, you know, um, how much less stress would there have been during the pandemic if people had been making better financial decisions before this impact wiped out forty million jobs? A hundred percent less stress. I guarantee you. The financial peace that comes, or the financial peace of mind that comes with debt freedom is unmatched. There's nothing like it, period. Nothing like it. And and it's a very emotional thing, especially for s- student loans. Um, once you pay that off, you just feel, you're just free. You're just, oh my gosh, like, I can do so many other things. Like, why was I giving my money away to Sally Mae or whatever your loan servicer is every month? It's, oh my gosh, it's perfect. No stress. It's so much better. So much better. Okay. There's not one day that I wake up and say, man, I wish I still had student loans. Oh, I wish I still had debt. Never. No one says that. No one wants debt. No, the best thing is really to get out of debt and create that wealth. Because as if you're not using the wealth to create, the, if you're not using debt to create wealth, you're just making someone else's money every month. And that's not fair. We work way too hard. As doctors, we should not be living under the burden of debt. No, have a stress-free life. Get out of debt. And and I, I want to say something else. I mean, um, I'm not exactly the uh, sharpest tool in the shed. I'm a little, I mean, I... My idea to became a dentist was because my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, was a dentist. Wow. Uh, think about that. Uh, my uh, The mother of my four children, um, I was locker 54. She was locker 56. I met her 10 minutes before high school started. I'm, I'm just, I just, uh, I've never invented a damn thing. And I was in Phoenix, and I had to drive by University of Phoenix online for like, Five years as it went from like one little building to two buildings, then a, then a bigger building, then a bigger building. And finally, when it got to 10 buildings in 2004, I started um, um, Dental Town Online, 489 courses. And I know on the website it says that there's only been 539,000 course views taken, but that's because most of all the courses expire in three, four years or whatever. But if you go look at all the course views since 2004, it's a million five hundred and thirty nine thousand. And and the average course is anywhere from free to like thirty six bucks. And and but my homies are like, oh, I, I want to learn one thing. So I'm going to get in an airplane and fly across the country and stay in a resort and then go to a class and then stay there three extra days. And I got to take my family. I mean, how can you learn without your family at the resort? And then they fly back. And here I am, Monday night football at the bar, two shots of Jameson and one beer down and say, okay, just tell me every single thing you learned at that course for 3000 bucks. And and they, they they tell me like like one thing. I'm like, dude, you could have taken 
every course on Dental Town. I, when I was in um, when I in, was in Cambodia and Malaysia and Indonesia, I, I saw this met this lovely lady who um, was that um, declared herself an endodontist. And by the way, I want to tell you about this guy that just died. I mean, my friend. Um, mm. Oh my gosh, um, those endodontists back in the day, um, um, you know. Um, they didn't go to endo school. They just had practice limited endo school. Mm -hmm. And I I was in a, a couple of towns where they had like eight or nine or 10 dentists. They said, oh, I just wish I could do pediatric dentistry. And I said, okay, well, I know for a fact <laughs> three of those other 10 hate pediatric dentistry. And I said, have you asked the other 10 that if, that if you just have practice limited to pediatric dentistry and swear to God, just like a pediatric dentist, you'll, you'll kick him out of here at 18 years old. And, and they went there and, and of course, all the other nine men said, hell yeah, take him because they didn't have a concussion injury at youth. And then, and now she's a pediatric dentist without going to pediatric dental school. Another guy, um, you, you went to Tufts. Tufts is a great school. Very, very expensive. But I know endodontists and pediatric dentists who were whining and crying to me about they couldn't uh, uh, get accepted into endodontic school or whatever. And I said, well, um, my gosh, Dominican Republic has 11 schools. Um, Grand Cayman has schools. Why don't you go down there? Um, you'll get accepted if you have a sack of cash and then get your degree and then come back here. And they go, do you think that works? And it's like, well, of course it works. I mean, did you know there are purses sold that don't have Gucci written on the outside and it's actually still a functional purse. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, um, I, again, on, on these online courses, it's like, yeah, when you're rich and famous, I mean, I've gone to Koi Spear, Panky Institute, Mish Institute, Elvia. Uh, I love them all, but I did it when I was rich I didn't do it on a damn credit card. And and why would you go spend $3,500 on a weekend if you could learn it online for $35? But anyway, that girl in Cambodia, she said, I, uh, um, she said, yeah, every night when I would come home, I would just go to YouTube and I would type in endodontic surgery and, and I just watch YouTube an hour or two a night and 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 she and I would have let her do a root canal on me any day of the week. I mean, she she learned it all for free, and that's what I call resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, resourcefulness. Um, I give you a problem. It's like the old deal. Like, uh, well, did you did you call him? Well, I didn't call him. I, I sent him an email. Well, did he reply? Uh, well, I I sent him a second email. Dude, it's been a week. I could have walked to his house, knocked on his door, and sat on his porch until he came home from work. I mean, resourcefulness. You know, uh, you know, um, why online CE? You can learn YouTube. You can learn everything in dentistry for free. Dental Town, 450 courses for under the price of a cab. I mean, dentist state, I swear to God, they just, it's almost like they spend extra time thinking, what is the longest distance between two points? Oh, God. And now you know why I don't have any friends. And uh, thank you for talking to me before Christmas. Uh, by the way, funny. I had another question about Tufts. Um, you went to Tufts. Did that school ever get accredited? Stop! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So uh, last question. I know it's been over an hour. Last question. Your website is doctorsoutofdebt.com. Yes. What are my homies going to do? What are they going to find when they go to doctorsoutofdebt.com and, and Facebook, uh, you have a doctors out of debt uh, mm -hmm. group, but, mm -hmm. but what are they going to find on that website besides a partridge in a pear tree? <laughs> Pretty much info on how to get out of debt, how to work with me, podcasts that I've been in, um, on, and some articles that I'm sharing, testimonials to see what other dentists or pharmacists or physicians or vets are saying as far as how debt repayment is the best thing um, to be able to create the wealth. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty fun website. Doctors out of debt, and you're on um, you're on um, Instagram and Facebook. And, mostly Facebook, uh, yes. Mostly Facebook. Yes. Now, do you know the owner of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg? Did you know his dad's a dentist? I know. I didn't know that. Yeah, you should have Ed come on. You should have Ed uh, do this. I I just love Ed. Uh, my gosh, uh, but not as much as I love you. I I do like you more than Ed. 
Um, but um, my gosh, um, it's a beautiful website. It's well done. She's got amazing articles. Uh, she's got a student loan interest calculator, net worth calculator, hiring advisor calculator course. I mean, it, it's just a great thing. But hey, I just want to, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of, um, um, you know, sometimes you go listen to people and they tell you everything you want to hear because you're their income stream. I mean, like when a new patient comes in uh, and says, uh, you know, you, you don't want to say what you want to say to them sometimes. Um, but I, I didn't start lecturing to find a friend. I didn't start my podcast to be a friend. It's called Dentistry and Censor. Where I come from, I'm old school. In old school, the if to show me to show you the love and respect I have for you, I'm going to tell you what I honestly believe. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. And and, and and my rule with my four boys is that you know when they were a birth to eighteen, like when they're two years old and starting to walk out into the middle of the street, I can't sit there and say, "Well, he's going to have to learn the hard way if I see a <laughs> cement truck coming." And uh, but he'll learn never to step out in front of a cement truck. Splat. I mean, so I told my boys their whole childhood from birth to eighteen, I am your father. I am your father, and I don't even care if you run away. I'll still find your ass, drag you back here, and we're going to be sitting here at the same problem. And then when they turn 18, I said, you're off to college, and now I'm your advisor. And um, so what I see now with my four boys, um, I'm, I'm not going to get involved unless they ask my opinion. And if they ask my opinion, I'm going to tell them the absolute honest freaking truth. You know what I mean? And my podcast, I'm not here to win friends and influence people. Hell, it's a free podcast. Um, go anywhere else to listen. But I'm telling you this, dude. Financial problems are a root of a lot of problems. Even uh, There's even people that think they have a drinking problem. They don't know they're drinking just so they don't think about their debt problems. I mean, yes. I mean it's all a big cloud. And the fastest way to happiness is... Is just to live below your means, man. You don't yes. need all that shit, and you don't need validated. You know, I know you wanted to do uh, do all these things to get validated. Well, I'll tell you why. I just validated you on the show in the name of the uh, incisor and the bicuspid and the molar and the tongue. You're validated. You're loved. You're special. You don't need that little BMW logo. You don't need a Range Rover. Um, you want to go on the best vacation in the world? Just get like twelve cases of beer and go fishing at the lake. I mean, you'll probably find out your best friend is the guy drinking two fishing poles down. You don't need to go to Hawaii. Um, you don't need any of that stuff. Just live below your means. And by the way, um, you know, when we grew up, so many things were so much cheaper. Like like when someone had a newborn baby. They, they, that right now you think, well, I got to go get a Hallmark card and a box of chocolates and get some outfit and all that stuff. You know what we used to do? We used to make them a pie, and if you're you're laying there nursing some baby, would you like a would you like a Hallmark card or a homemade pie? I mean, go mow their lawn. Um, there were these three sisters that lived next to me uh, when we were poor growing up on Rutan, and they were like three ladies, and they were all like over ninety years old. And I used to every time I mowed our yard, I'd always mow their yard because they're three old ladies. Oh, my God, they always come out there and give me Milky Ways and Snickers bars and Butterfingers, all the stuff my mom could never afford. But, man, just just get old school. Get old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then what it is for me, like like right now, my, my car, my Lexus, is a um, 2004, has 175,000 miles on it. Wow. And, I mean, my gosh, I mean... Why? And then every time I take you to Lex Theater Show, they say, you know, if you leave your car here <laughs> yes. and give me a check for a hundred grand, I'll get you a new one. And you know yes. what I like the most about my Lexus car? You know what I like the most about it? Is when I was backing out of the driveway like five years ago, my granddaughter decides to open the car door. Perfect timing to catch the garage deal and bend my car back. And she starts crying and everything. I'm like, hey, 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 no one's hurt. Who cares about a car? We're fine. Stop it. And then I just, uh, just, I had to like barge, bulldoze the door like three times to get it to shut. <laughs> Every time I see that dent, I just think of my granddaughter and then I just smile. I don't even want to sell the car because I have the warmest, fuzziest feelings every time I see that big dent in the car. And then when I come out of the grocery store and someone's left their 
their grocery cart stuck in my side of my car and scratched it. I don't care. It didn't mess up the dent. But hey, um, thank you so much for coming on my show. I love what you're doing. I love your mission. And my gosh, and I love my homies that they want to go to Spear and Coise and Panky. And I love the fact that they went to school eight years to help you get out of pain with their hands. I love dentists, but they ain't good with money. They spend over their head. They spend over the degree. Carolyn, thank you so much for thank deciding for um, to come on the show and get these dentists um, to stop spending money. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And I hope you have a merry, very, wary Christmas. You too, Doc. All right. Have a good Christmas and happy New Year's. And everybody go to Instagram. Doctors Out of Debt, Facebook, Doctors Out of Debt, a reader, 70-some posts on Dental Town, and uh, hopefully someday you'll make us an online CE course to give them more tools. Absolutely. You got it. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye now.